also be consistent with the society you want to create. Violence, he said, begets violence. Hatred begets hatred. Anger begets anger. Every minute of the day, in the smallest of moments, as well as the largest. I have an additional 30 seconds. I thank the gentleman. So granted. Ladies and gentlemen, we remember the difficult path we trod as a nation to ensure the participation of all. And we ought to do everything we can to preserve it in our own day. It is not just history that we want to learn. It is the lesson for today that we must remember and learn. I thank John Lewis for his leadership. I thank the thousands, black and white, young and old, rich and poor, who joined together to make America a better place. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from California. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. At this time, it's my pleasure to yield one minute to the gentleman from Virginia, the Majority Leader, Mr. Cantor. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman from California, Chairman. Mr. Speaker, on March 7, 1965, in Selma, Alabama, now Congressman John Lewis, our colleague, led 600 brave Americans in a march to protest for their equal right to vote like any other American. And they encountered horrific and despicable violence, preventing them from reaching their destination, the Capitol, in Montgomery. That day, now known as Bloody Sunday, set the stage for the landmark march to Montgomery led by Reverend Martin Luther King and bolstered by faith and prayer. This act of leadership, courage, and bravery culminated with Congress passing the Voting Rights Act of 1965, recognizing the right of every American to participate in our electoral process. At that time, there were just six black members of Congress. Today, I am proud to serve with 44 black colleagues. As Reverend King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Mr. Speaker, today we will pass a resolution that will add the testimonies of members of Congress, current and past, who participated in the civil rights movement and commemorative events to the historic record of the House. Their stories are an important part of our nation's heritage and will serve as a reminder to every American of the determination and sacrifice that shaped the stronger democracy we live in today. I'd like to thank Representative Terry Sewell, who represents Selma, and Representative Martha Roby, who represents Montgomery, for offering this resolution to preserve a powerful and transformative period in American history. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm extremely honored to work with Congressman Lewis to ensure that these stories will never be forgotten. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Representative from Georgia. Mr. Speaker, uh, may I inquire about how much time we... I believe you have four and a half minutes. The gentleman from California has 11 and a half minutes. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Coyne, for three minutes. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank also Representative Sewell and Roby for sponsoring this resolution and Congressman Lewis for his life. This is an historic uh, resolution for the work and the memories need to be preserved. I, like Congressman Sewell, am here because of the work of Congressman Lewis and other civil rights leaders, making this for a better America. I didn't think I needed to go on the pilgrimage because I'm from Memphis, and I've been to the Mason Temple where Dr. King made his last speech, and been to the Lorraine Motel and the National Civil Rights Museum on many occasions, and to the Ask Me Hall where he rallied workers, now known, named for Jerry Wirf. But when I went to Birmingham, when I went to Montgomery, when I went to Selma, I realized that there was much more history that I needed to know, and there was a way to be filled with the spirit of the Civil Rights Movement, which one is when one goes to the Rosa Parks Museum, the Dexter Street Church, the 16th Street Church, the Civil Rights Institute, and the bridge. It's hard to fathom the way the world was in 1965, but that was only a short number of years ago. This country 
started with a history of slavery and was accepted by the Founding Fathers and others as the way things were. The Founding Fathers were great men, and they wrote words that were great, but they were without absolute meaning because they accepted as a given that African Americans should be slaves and women shouldn't have equality. It took a civil war to change some of that, and then it took John Lewis and civil rights workers to change the Jim Crow laws that followed up that didn't accept the outcome of the war and continued a segregated society that said African Americans weren't equal, couldn't go in public places and public accommodations and public restaurants and transit just like others. Well, that changed. And the people who changed that, the civil rights workers, the marchers, the sit-ins, the freedom riders, Bob Filner was a freedom rider and arrested a congressperson, those people made the promise that was given fulfilled. It's still a work. I introduced in this House passed in 2007 an apology for slavery and Jim Crow. It took till 2007 for this House to pass it. And I appreciate the fact that when I did introduce it and it passed, that there were two Republican sponsors, but there were just two Republican sponsors. This year I have H. Res. 30, 60, excuse me, 3866 that recognizes all civil rights workers with a congressional gold medal. I'm sorry to say that to this date there's not a single Republican sponsor. There should be. Civil rights is as Republican as is Democrat. The party of Lincoln as the party of Kennedy provided civil rights. And in 1965 when that Voting Rights Act passed there were people like Everett Dirksen who cast important votes. I urge my Republican colleagues to support this resolution and to support HRES 3688 and honor the civil rights workers who had to fight their country for their rights and privileges. I yield back the balance of my Thanks time. Expired. Gentleman from California. Uh, uh, may I make an inquiry as to whether uh, the gentleman on the other side, Mr. Lewis, has additional speakers? Uh, we don't have uh, any additional speakers. Um, and how much time do we have? The gentleman from California has 11 and a half. The gentleman from Georgia has one and a half minutes. If the gentleman from Georgia needs any more time? I just take a, a minute. Uh, oh, okay. I, I would. Uh, gentleman from California reserves. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, my friend and my colleague from California for his commitment, for his dedication, with all of his kind words today. I think this resolution is saying to all of us that we have come a distance. We've made a lot of progress. And the members of Congress participated in helping to bring about what I like to call a nonviolent revolution in America, a revolution of values, a revolution of ideas. It is unreal, it is unbelievable. Just think a few short years ago, in a place like Selma, Alabama, Lowndes County, Alabama, between Selma and Montgomery. Lowndes County was more than 80% African American. There was not a single registered African American voter in the county. Today, there's a biracial county government. That in a city like Selma, in 1965, only 2.1% of African American were registered to vote. Today, there's a biracial city government. In a state like the state of Mississippi in 1965, the state had an African-American population, voting age population, of more than 450,000, and only about 16,000 were registered to vote. Because of the action of presidents and members of Congress, we have changed. And it's my hope and my prayer that every member of Congress will vote to pass this resolution. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman kneels back, gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself as time as I may consume. And Mr. Speaker, I just want to uh, echo the words of, uh, of my friend, Mr. Lewis. Uh, let us have all members uh, vote uh, for this resolution. It is a recognition, a simple, straightforward, symbolic resolution recognizing the efforts of so many as embodied in uh, the gentleman, Mr. Lewis, and others who worked so hard to change this country for the better. 
and uh, I'm honored to be here on the floor with Mr. Lewis today. Uh, I appreciate uh, the chance I had to be with him in this march several years ago. I encourage all members to take part in that, either this year or in the future, and I ask all members to support this, and with that, I would yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. All time for debate has expired. Pursuant to the order of the House of Wednesday, February 29, 2012, the resolution is considered read and the previous question is ordered on the resolution and on the preamble. The question is on the adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The resolution is agreed to. On that, I request a recorded vote. The gentleman asks for the ayes and nays. Ayes and nays. The ayes and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the ayes and nays will rise. Clearly a sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, this 15-minute vote on adoption of the House Resolution 562 will be followed by a five-minute vote on motions to suspend the rules on S1134 and House Resolution 556. This is a 15-minute vote. For the past hour or so, the House has had under consideration a resolution telling the Office of House Historian to compile oral histories from members of the House who participated in the historic and annual civil rights marches from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. Fifteen-minute vote followed by two five-minute votes on measures they debated yesterday, one which condemns Iran for imprisoning a Christian citizen for his religion and requiring that person to raise his children under Islam. The other bill deals with a proposed new bridge over the St. Croix River between Minnesota and Wisconsin. But this first vote is 15 minutes over in the Senate today. Debate underway on an amendment, proposed amendment to the uh, surface transportation bill. This is an amendment by uh, Roy Blunt, Senator Roy Blunt of Missouri. A procedural vote set for 11:30 this morning. That amendment would allow health insurance plans to decline to cover an item if it's against the issuer's religious beliefs. Debate underway. You can follow that on C-SPAN 2. And some news from the political journalism world this morning. Andrew Breitbart has died. The conservative media, media publisher and activist uh, was found in Brentwood, California in his neighborhood, neighborhood last night according to the Associated Press. Andrew Breitbart dead at the age of uh, 43. Well, during this 15-minute vote, we're going to take you to one of several hearings we're covering today. Ben Bernanke, the Federal Reserve Chair, back on Capitol Hill for a second day of testimony on his biannual monetary report, this time before the Senate Banking Committee. We'll take you there live during this first vote. Restricted for many potential borrowers. Consumer sentiment, which dropped sharply last summer, has since rebounded but remains relatively low. In the housing sector, affordability has increased dramatically as a result of the decline in house prices and historically low interest rates on conventional mortgages. Unfortunately, many potential buyers lack the down payment and credit history required to qualify for loans. Others are reluctant to buy a house now because of concerns about their income, employment prospects, and the future path of home prices. On the supply side of the market, about 30% of recent home sales have consisted of foreclosed or distressed properties, and home vacancy rates remain high, putting downward pressure on home prices. More positive signs include a pickup in construction in the multifamily sector and recent increases in home builder sentiment. Manufacturing production has increased 15% since the trough of the recession and has posted solid gains since the middle of last year, supported by the recovery in motor vehicle supply chains and ongoing increases in business investment and exports. Real business spending for equipment and software rose at an annual rate of about 12% over the second half of 2011 a bit faster than in the first half of the year. But real export growth, while remaining solid, slowed somewhat over the same period as foreign economic activity decelerated, particularly in Europe. The members of the board and the presidents of the Federal Reserve Banks recently projected that economic activity in 2012 will expand at or somewhat above the pace registered in the second half of last year. Specifically, their projections for growth in real GDP this year provided in conjunction with the January meeting of the FOMC, have a central tendency of 2.2 to 2.7 percent. 
These forecasts were considerably lower than the projections they made last June. A number of factors have played a role in this reassessment. First, the annual revisions to the national income and project accounts released last summer indicated that the recovery had been somewhat slower than previously estimated. In addition, fiscal and financial strains in Europe have weighed on financial conditions and global economic growth, and problems in U.S. housing and mortgage markets have continued to hold down not only construction and related industries, but also household wealth and confidence. Looking beyond 2012, FOMC participants expect that economic activity will pick up gradually as these headwinds fade, supported by a continuation of the highly accommodative stance for monetary policy. With output growth in 2012 projected to remain close to its longer run trend, participants did not anticipate further substantial declines in the unemployment rate over the course of this year. Looking beyond this year, FOMC participants expect the unemployment rate to continue to edge down only slowly towards levels consistent with the committee's statutory mandate. In light of the somewhat different signals received recently from the labor market, then from indicators of final demand and production, it will, however, be especially important to evaluate incoming information to assess the underlying pace of the economic recovery. At our January meeting, participants agreed that strains in global financial markets pose significant downside risks to the economic outlook. Investors' concerns about fiscal deficits and the levels of government debt in a number of European countries have led to substantial increases in sovereign borrowing costs, stresses in the European banking system, and associated reductions in the availability of credit and economic activity in the Euro area. To help prevent strains in Europe from spilling over to the U.S. economy, the Federal Reserve in November agreed to extend and to modify the terms of its swap lines with other major central banks, and it continues to monitor the European exposures of U.S. financial institutions. A number of constructive policy actions have been taken of late in Europe, including the European Central Bank's program to extend three-year collateralized loans to European financial institutions. Most recently, European policymakers agreed on a new package of measures for Greece, which combines additional official sector loans with a sizable reduction of Greek debt held by the private sector. However, critical fiscal and financial challenges remain for the Eurozone, the resolution of which will require concerted action on the part of the European authorities. Further steps will also be required to boost growth and competitiveness in a number of countries. We are in frequent contact with our counterparts in Europe and will continue to follow the situation closely. As I discussed in my July testimony, inflation picked up during the early part of 2011. A surge in the prices of oil and other commodities, along with su supply disruptions associated with the disaster in Japan that put upward pressure on motor vehicle prices, pushed overall inflation to an annual rate of more than 3% over the first half of last year. As we had expected, however, these factors proved transitory and inflation moderated to an annual rate of 1.5% during the second half of the year close to its average pace in the preceding two years. In the projections made in January, the committee anticipated that over coming quarters, inflation will run at or below the 2% level we judge most consistent with our statutory mandate. Specifically, the central tendency of participants' forecasts for inflation in 2012 ranged from 1.4 to 1.8%, about unchanged from the projections made last June. Looking farther ahead, participants expected the subdued level of inflation to persist beyond this year. Since these projections were made, gasoline prices have moved up, primarily reflecting higher global oil prices, a development that is likely to push up inflation temporarily while reducing consumers' purchasing power. We will continue to monitor energy markets carefully. Longer-term inflation expectations, as measured by surveys and financial market indicators, appear consistent with the view that inflation will remain subdued. Against this backdrop of restrained growth, persistent downside risk to the outlook for at real activity and moderating inflation, the committee took several steps to provide additional monetary accommodation during the second half of 2011 and early 2012. These steps included changes to the forward rate guidance included in the committee's post-meeting statements and adjustments to the Federal Reserve's holdings of Treasury and agency securities. The target range for the federal funds rate remains at zero to one-fourth percent, and the forward guidance language in the FOMC policy statement provides an indication of how long the committee expects that target range to be appropriate. 
In August, the committee clarified the forward guidance language, noting that economic conditions, including low rates of resource utilization and a subdued outlook for inflation over the medium run, were likely to warrant exceptionally low levels for the federal funds rate, at least through the middle of 2013. By providing a longer time horizon than had previously been expected by the public, the statement tended to put downward pressure on longer term interest rates. At the January 2012 FOMC meeting, the committee amended the forward guidance further, extending the horizon over which it expects economic conditions to warrant exceptionally low levels of the federal funds rate to at least through late 2014. In addition to the adjustments made to the forward guidance, the committee modified its policies regarding the Federal Reserve's holdings of securities. In September, the committee put in place a maturity extension program that combines purchases of longer term treasury securities with sales of shorter term treasury securities. The objective of this program is to lengthen the average maturity of our securities holdings without generating a significant change in the size of our balance sheet. Removing longer term securities from the market should put downward pressure on longer term interest rates and help make financial market conditions more supportive of economic growth than they otherwise would have been. To help support conditions in mortgage markets, the committee also decided at its September meeting to reinvest principal received from its holdings of agency debt and agency mortgage-backed securities back into agency MBS, rather than continuing to reinvest those proceeds in longer-term treasury securities, as had been the practice since August 2010. The committee reviews the size and compositions of its securities holdings regularly and is prepared to adjust those holdings as appropriate to promote a stronger economic recovery in the context of price stability. Before concluding, I'd like to say just a few words about the statement of longer run goals and policy strategy that the FOMC issued at the conclusion of its January meeting. The statement reaffirms our commitment to our statutory objectives given to us by the Congress of price stability and maximum employment. Its purpose is to provide additional transparency and increase the effectiveness of monetary policy. The statement does not imply a change in how the committee conducts policy. Transparency is enhanced by providing greater specificity about our objectives. Because the inflation rate over the longer run is determined primarily by monetary policy, it is feasible and appropriate for the committee to set a numerical goal for that key variable. The FOMC judges that an inflation rate of 2%, as measured by the annual change in the price index for personal consumption expenditures, is most consistent over the longer run with its statutory mandate. While maximum employment stands on an equal footing with price stability as an objective of monetary policy, the maximum level of employment in the economy is largely determined by non-monetary factors that affect the structure and dynamics of the labor market. It is therefore not feasible for any central bank to specify a fixed goal for the longer run level of employment. However, the committee can estimate the level of maximum employment and use that estimate to inform policy decisions. In our most recent projections in January, for example, FOMC participants' estimates of the longer run normal rate of unemployment had a central tendency of 5.2 to 6.0 percent. As I noted a moment ago, the level of maximum employment in an economy is subject to change. For instance, it can be affected by shifts in the structure of the economy and by a range of economic policies. If at some stage the committee estimated that the maximum level of employment had increased, for example, we would adjust monetary policy accordingly. The dual objectives of price stability and maximum employment are generally complementary. Indeed, at present, with the unemployment rate elevated and the inflation outlook subdued, the committee judges that sustaining a highly accommodative stance for monetary policy is consistent with promoting both objectives. However, in cases where these objectives are not complementary, the committee follows a balanced approach in promoting them, taking into account the magnitudes of the deviations of inflation and employment from levels judged to be consistent with the dual mandate, as well as the potentially different time horizons over which employment and inflation are projected to return to such levels. Thank you, and of course, I'm pleased to take your questions. <clears throat> Thank you for your testimony. We will now, now begin the questioning of our witness. Will the clerk please put five minutes on the clock for each member for the questions? Dr. Malenke, what are the reasons for the modest pace of the current expansion? Is the economy recovering as you would, would expect following a, a major financial crisis, or has a great recession led to any permanent adjustments in either output 
our unemployment levels? Mr. Chairman, um, normally when, a, when a, the economy suffers a severe recession, the recovery is comparatively stronger. So a sharp decline tends to have a stronger expansion uh, subsequently. However, uh, our economy has been hit by two uh, unusual shocks. One is the uh, housing boom and bust, and we know from history that, uh, and, and recent Fed research supports this, that uh, housing busts um, tend to take uh, some time to, um, uh, to be offset, uh, in particular since housing is an important part of the recovery process in most expansions. Additionally, we have had a severe financial crisis, which has left uh, still many stresses in the banking system and on the financial system. And again, research, uh, notably by uh, Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhart, has pointed out that historically uh, that uh, recoveries following financial crisis also tend to be somewhat slower than they otherwise would be. So having been hit by both of these factors, and with housing problems still being uh, important, as you noted, um, and as uh, with financial conditions, including some of the stresses uh, coming from Europe, uh, still uh, being uh, dragged to some extent on economic activity, um, we have had a slower recovery than we otherwise would have anticipated. Uh, nevertheless, uh, of course, we have had now uh, growth since mid-2009, uh, and unemployment has come down, but of course, uh, not, uh, the, the growth is not as strong, and the improvement in un the unemployment rate is not as quick as obviously we would like. U.S. consumers are deleveraging to reduce high debt levels. Credit is still tight for U.S. companies and households, and fiscal policy has begun to tighten. As we consider economic growth in the near and long term, should Congress enact drastic spending cuts in policy budget this year, or would a plan to curb deficits and address structural issues over a longer time horizon make more sense economically. Also, what sectors of our economy could provide sustainable growth over the long ter term? Well, Mr. Chairman, so first of all, as uh, Senator Shelby correctly pointed out, the Federal Reserve doesn't make recommendations on specific fiscal uh, policy decisions. But in the broad context, um, uh, let me make two points. Uh, the first is that, um, as I've said on a number of occasions, including in front of this committee, uh, the United States is on an unsustainable fiscal path looking out uh, over the next uh, couple of decades. Um, if we continue along that path, eventually um, we will face a, a, a fiscal and financial crisis that will be very uh, bad for growth and, and for stability. And so therefore, whatever we do, it is very important that we be planning now for a long-term improvement in uh, our situation uh, in terms of long-term fiscal sustainability. Uh, at the same time, I think it is important that we keep in mind that the recovery is not yet complete, the unemployment remains high, the rate of growth is modest, and under current law, as you know, um, on January 1st uh, of 2013, there will be a, a major shift in the fiscal position of the United States, including um, the expiration of a number of tax uh, cuts and uh, other tax provisions um, together with uh, the sequestration and other provisions that would together uh, create a very sharp shift in the fiscal stance of, of the federal government. Um, I think that uh, we could achieve the very desirable long-run fiscal consolidation that we definitely need and we need to do soon, but we can do that in a way that um, doesn't provide such a, a major shock to the recovery in the near term. And so I'm sure that Congress will be debating the details of this uh, over the next year um, and trying to take into account both the need for uh, protecting the recovery at the same time uh, ensuring and, uh, that we do achieve fiscal sustainability in the long term. On your second part of your question, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, we are seeing in manufacturing uh, and uh, industrial production in general have been leading uh, the recovery. Housing, which normally does lead the recovery, of course, is lagging. Um, but generally, it's, uh, it's and automobiles, of course, being one part of manufacturing. Um, but uh, generally, it's hard to predict, of course, what, uh, what sectors will be most, um, uh, will have the greatest growth in the longer term. 
you asked me earlier uh, in the first question about um, potential growth. We don't see at this point that the very severe uh, recession has permanently affected the growth potential of the U.S. economy, um, although, of course, we continue to monitor productivity gains and the like. But one concern we do have, of course, is the fact that more than 40 percent of the uh, unemployed have been unemployed for six months or more. Those folks um, are either leaving the labor force or having their skills eroded. Um, and although we haven't seen much sign of it yet, um, if that situation persists uh, for much longer, then that will reduce the human capital that is part of our growth process going forward. I have been working with my colleagues in the Senate to move forward a set of proposals to update the securities laws and make it easier for startups and small business to raise capital while maintaining critical investor protections. Do you generally agree that these types of proposals will help create jobs and strengthen our economic recovery? Well, Mr. Chairman, I don't know the specific proposals. Um, but it is certainly true uh, that startup companies, companies under five years old, um, create a very substantial part of the jobs that are added in our economy. And of course, if there's anything that can be done to encourage uh, startups and entrepreneurship, whether it's uh, re reducing burdensome regulation or providing other kinds of assistance, um, of course, Congress makes all the decisions and, 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 and about the specifics, but um, again, uh, promoting uh, startups uh, is, a, I think, an important direction for job creation. And in particular, uh, the fact that startups and job and uh, business creation has been quite weak during the expansion is one of the reasons that job creation has lagged behind the usual recovery pattern. Senator Shelby. Thank you. <clears throat> Chairman Bernanke, at our last hearing right here in the committee on the European debt crisis, I asked the Federal Reserve witness about the exposure of our largest banks to the European financial system. The Fed is yet to respond to our, my request for this information. Will you provide the committee with this information regarding the individual exposures of our largest banks to Europe? Of course. Um, Supervisory information has legal protections, but we'd be happy to work with the, uh, with the committee to provide you with the information you but need. But we need to know what's going on as far as your, your, our exposure of our banks to Europe. Yes, you we want to make, sure, that, we we want to make sure that you understand the situation, have you all the information you need to make good decisions. I w just wanted to add that um, the SEC, uh, working with other agencies, has provided uh, now some guidance and templates to banks to provide public information mm -hmm. on a quarterly basis about their exposures and their hedges. Uh, but uh, yes, we, we certainly can work with you to help you understand uh, everything you need to, to know to make uh, good decisions. Are you concerned with uh, uh, exposure, some exposure of our largest banks to Europe? Well, we're, we're concerned in the sense that we're paying a lot of attention to it. Um, our, our sense is that, and having done a lot of work on this, and including um, uh, asking banks to stress their European positions in their current uh, capital stress test that they're, that they're doing now, um, our sense is that the direct exposures of U.S. banks to sovereign debt uh, in Europe, particularly that of the weaker countries, is quite limited and is, is well hedged, and that those hedges in turn are pretty good hedges, that is, that the counterparties are are uh, diversified and financially strong. Um, so if you look more broadly, of course, our banks are exposed to European companies and banks. Inevitably, they're major trading partners and major financial partners. Again, uh, they've been working hard to uh, uh, have a, to provide a, adequate hedges. But let me just say, I mean, I think it's very important to note that if there's a major financial problem in Europe, there'll be so many different channels on which that would affect the stability of our financial system that I, I wouldn't want to take too much comfort from that. Could you explain uh, to, to, to the committee, to this member too, uh, the situation as far as credit default swaps and why they're not deemed to have uh, uh, certain nations defaulted to trigger the action on that. What, what's going on here? Is this, is this a, uh, 
a government intervention in no, the market, or what is that? No, sir. There, there is um, a private body, uh, the ISDA, which makes determinations as to whether um, a credit event has occurred. And when a default happens. a default occurred, that's right. And in the case of Reese, which is the relevant issue, thus far um, there has been a um, uh, so-called private sector involvement, a purportedly voluntary agreement with the uh, private sector bondholders. And there's also been a um, uh, exchange of uh, bonds by ECB and other government uh, agencies with Greece that essentially gives some protection to the ECB for its debt, Greek debt holdings. Um, the news this morning, uh, I believe, was that the ISDA had determined that those two events did not constitute a vote, credit event for the, the purpose of the... Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. On this vote. The A's are 418, the nays are zero, the resolution is agreed to, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Petri, to suspend the rules and pass SA1134, on which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Senate 1134, an act to authorize the St. Croix River Crossing Project with appropriate mitigation measures to promote river values. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill? Members will record their vote by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. The House unanimously approves a resolution that the Office of House Historian compile oral histories from members of the House who participated in the historic and annual civil rights marches from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. Just a couple more votes here, and that'll wrap it up for the week in the uh, U.S. House. They're back on Monday, but no votes until 6.30 on Monday. This vote, a bill debated yesterday, deals with a proposed new bridge over the St. Croix River between Minnesota and Wisconsin. One more vote will follow this. Over in the Senate, meanwhile, in about 45 minutes, a vote, a procedural vote, on Roy Blunt's amendment, amendment the senator from Missouri, a proposed amendment to the, um, to the Senate Surface Transportation Bill. His amendment would allow health insurance plans to decline coverage of an item if it's against uh, the issuer's religious beliefs. Debate's underway. You can follow that on C-SPAN 2. And again, the uh, procedural vote set for 1130. Okay. As this vote continues, we'll take you back to the testimony of Fed Chair Ben Bernanke. Back to um, a, a more normal size balance sheet consisting only of Treasury securities. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Reid. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairman Bernanke. And let me just say, I, I thought that the uh, Federal Reserve's white paper on housing was very thoughtful, very analytical, and non-prescriptive, which is appropriate. I think also, um, thinking back, uh, such an analytical paper might have been extremely useful to us in 2005 or 6 or 7 to alert policymakers to developments within the housing market that proved to be catastrophic. And the final point, I think, is that it is uh, fully consistent with the enhanced responsibilities under the FSOC that the Federal Reserve must display. So on all those points, I, I think it was appropriate. Uh, one of the, the, the issues that was raised in the paper, and which you might elaborate on, is that there, there are short-term uh, programs that might, in the long term, produce more returns 
enhanced value to the government and taxpayers. But if they're not pursued, even if there's a upfront cost, that they're, ironically, we could have even a further deterioration in the, the profit, profitability assets uh, of these GSEs. Can you elaborate on that, Mr. Chairman? Certainly, and I'd like just quickly to mention to Senator Shelby, who asked about this, that the speeches given by Governors Duke and President Dudley are their own recognizance. They don't represent official Fed positions, and of course, as you know, Fed, Fed members often give their views, their own individual views. Um, sorry, Senator Reid. Um, uh, one point that we make uh, is that um, in, in a typical negotiation between a borrower and a lender, a modification or some other um, arrangement like a short sale or a deed in lieu, for example, or other activities like uh, REO to rental are typically taken on a narrow economic basis of the benefits of the, of the lender and the borrower, which is, makes sense in a, in a free market economy. But in the current situation, I think it's important at least to recognize that the um, problems in the housing sector, including massive numbers of foreclosures, uncertainty about the number of houses coming on the market, whole neighborhoods with many empty houses, all of those things have implications not only for the borrower and the lender, but also for the neighborhood, for the community, and of course for the national economy, because um, the weaknesses in the housing market, again, as I mentioned earlier, are slowing the pace of the recovery, and from the Federal Reserve's point of view, are probably uh, muting to some effect, to some extent, the impact of our low interest rate policy, because low mortgage rates don't help if people can't get mortgage credit. So. Um, some of the benefits of actions to improve conditions in the housing market go beyond just those of the lender and the borrower and, and accrue to the broader society as well. And, uh, and one other point and you might comment upon is that th we have several challenges facing us economically, and as, as you illustrated, one is the housing market, the other is potential energy spikes. Uh, relatively speaking, it seems to me that we have much more ability to influence effectively and correctly housing policy here than international energy prices, and as a result, it would be, uh, I think, a, a good investment of our time and effort to do so. Is that a fair comment? Or? Well, I think if there was a goal of the white paper, it was simply to encourage Congress to look at these issues, which um, uh, represent, I think, one of the directions whereby we could be doing something on a policy basis to, that would, might help the recovery be stronger. Let me uh, turn to the issue of the, the Volcker rule, which is pending. The uh, European uh, governments are urging that their sovereign uh, equities be sort of treated preferentially in the rule, even though, as I understand, you might correct me, that under the, the Basel uh, rules, uh, there's a zero risk rating to sovereign debt. Is that, is that correct? There is a zero risk weighting, yes. So the Greek debt is, has no risk? Uh, well, the way that's been handled by uh, the European banking authorities at the moment is to force the... The nays are 83, uh, two-thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended and the bill is... Mr. Kingston. Mr. Kingston votes aye. Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Garamendi votes aye. Mr. Bustani. Mr. Bustani votes aye. Mr. Kaufman of Colorado. Off no on I for Mr. Kaufman of Colorado. Now, does any of you wish to change the Mr. McGovern. Off no on I for Mr. McGovern. 
Mr. Olver. Off no on I for Mr. Olver. On this vote, the final vote is 339 in favor, 88. On this vote, the final vote is 339 in favor, 80 against the two-thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts, to suspend the rules and agree to House Resolution 556 as amended, on which the A's and A's were ordered. The clerk will report the title of the resolution. House Resolution 556, resolution condemning the government of Iran for its continued persecution, imprisonment, and sentencing of Yusuf Nader Khani on the charge of apostasy. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and agree to the resolution as amended? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. And it should be the last roll call vote of the week. This is a resolution that condemns Iran for imprisoning a Christian citizen for his religion and requiring him to raise his children under Islam. This is a five-minute vote. Vote coming up in about 40 minutes in the Senate. A uh, vo procedural vote, a motion to table a resolution, the resolution by Missouri Republican Roy Blunt, which would allow health insurance plans to decline to cover an item if it's against the issuer's religious beliefs. And that's coming up at 11.30. You can follow that debate and vote on C-SPAN 2. Secretary Sebelius, the Health and Human Services Secretary, asked about that amendment this morning at the hearing on her 2013 budget. That's live now at cspan.org. We're also covering the hearing this morning online with uh, Fed Chair Ben Bernanke. And we're going to take you to that now as this five-minute vote continues. Uh, Cost-benefit analysis and fine-tuning that the agencies are now trying to give it. Well, Senator, we certainly don't expect people to obey a rule that doesn't exist. Uh, there is a two-year conformance period built into the statute that allows two years from the prom from July of this year before that they have before they have to conform to the rule and um, uh, we will certainly make sure that the firms have all the time they need to to respond and I think two years will probably be adequate in that respect well thank you uh, I'd, I'd like to shift during the remainder of my questions to a, the topic of a question that the chairman asked you about whether it is time for us to begin more aggressively controlling the spend out rate in Congress's spending habits or uh, whether we need to continue to hold off because of, of the impact on the economy. And I believe, as, as I understood your response, you indicated that in January we're going to see tax relief or tax cuts expire and we're going to see uh, the sequestration impact. A number of other things will happen. And uh, I believe your answer was that soon we need to take some action. Uh, and I want to pursue that with you a little more and in this context. Uh, we've been having this debate in Congress now for a number of years, uh, but I want to go back to the Bull Simpson Commission, which uh, issued its report uh, two plus years ago now. Mm -hmm. And in, in that report, uh, it was recognized that there needed to be a, a, an easing into the aggressive control of spending in Washington. And uh, immediately following that, uh, we had the deb debate over the $800 billion stimulus bill where the argument was made, you know, it's not time to control federal spending yet. Um, we, we need another year or two before we start getting into the serious control of spending. And between then and now, we have basically put about another $5 trillion on the national debt, not to count the trillions of dollars that have been uh, used to help sustain economic activity, uh, whether we agree with them or not from the, the Fed's actions. And uh, we still see uh, the argument being made that it's not time yet for us to become aggressively engaged in controlling the spending excesses in Washington, even though we have over uh, 40 cents of every dollar borrowed today. And the budgets that are being proposed uh, continue that trend for the next decade. I know you don't get 
heavily engaged in fiscal policy, but you've already tiptoed a little bit into those waters. And I'd like to ask you, when will it be time? I, I believe it's past time. Mm -hmm. But when will it be time, if it's not time now, for us to start aggressively dealing with the fiscal structure of our country on the spending side of the equation? Uh, just a word on the Fed. The Fed's purchases of securities actually reduce the deficit because of the interest that comes back to the Treasury. Um, the two things are not incompatible. Uh, y you know, you can uh, moderate the n very near-term impact at the same time that you make strong and decisive actions to put us on a path. I mean, you haven't, you haven't done, you haven't taken the actions, you haven't, you haven't passed the laws that will uh, bring us on a glide path into sustainability over the next decade or so. And I would add that um, one, I think one concern there is that the, as I mentioned yesterday, is that the 10-year budget window may artificially constrain some of the things that Congress should be thinking about because many of the issues that we face in terms not only of entitlements but other issues as well are, are multi-decade issues. And I think you could take strong actions um, that would be taking place over time. I, I think about the, uh, the early 80s Social Security reform that phased in a whole bunch of things, including the later retirement age, which is still happening today, 30 years later. Um, so you could take those actions, lock them in, you could get the benefit of the confidence there, but it wouldn't have necessarily quite as big an impact as the very big shock that would otherwise occur um, uh, next January 1st. I'm not saying that you can't do it and take serious action. I just think you should uh, balance those objectives. Well, thank you. I, I take it that you're saying that uh, we need to adopt a long-term plan to deal with this crisis. Absolutely. Uh, and I would just observe that uh, at this point, the budgets that are being proposed uh, simply go the other direction. We still, other than some of the others, like the Bull Simpson Commission and, and others, we still haven't got proposals on the table here in Congress to deal with that long-term plan, and I personally think it's time we get at it. Senator Menendez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bernanke, for your service. Um, I, I, I read your statement, and I'm just, you know, obviously creating jobs is the singular most important issue in our country for families, for our collective and economy. When such a large part of our GDP is consumer demand. Obviously, without income, there isn't the opportunity to make that demand. How would you describe how are the latest programs of quantitative easing and Operation Twist uh, helping us get to a more robust growth and creating those opportunities? Well, of course, it's very difficult to, um, to uh, figure out exactly how to attribute the progress that we have made to monetary policy, to fiscal policy, to other uh, sources of growth. Um, but the, um, uh, if you look at the, the record, um, for example, if you look back at, um, at uh, the quantitative easing two, so-called, in November 2010, um, the concerns at the time were that it would be highly inflationary, it would, it would hurt the dollar. Um, that it would not have much effect on growth, et cetera. Um, but uh, since uh, November 2010, um, uh, where we've had since then the QE2 and the, um, uh, the so-called Operation Twist, uh, we've had about 2.5 million jobs created. Um, we've seen big gains in uh, stock prices, improvements in credit markets. Um, the dollar is about flat. Uh, commodity prices, X oil, uh, are not much changed. Inflation is doing well in the sense that we are looking at about 2% inflation rate for this year. Um, so uh, I think that, you know, at least uh, uh, and one other The yeas are 417, the nays are one, two-thirds being present in the affirmative. The rules are suspended. The resolution is agreed to. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table.
What purpose does the gentleman from Maryland rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to speak out of order for one minute for the purposes of inquiring of the majority leader the schedule for the week to come. Objection to order. And I uh, uh, yield to my friend, the majority leader, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Cantor. I thank, thank the gentleman, Mr. Speaker, the Democratic Whip, uh, the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you for yielding. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on Monday, the House will meet at noon for morning hour and 2 p.m. for legislative business. Votes will be postponed until 6.30 p.m. On Tuesday and Wednesday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for morning hour and noon for legislative business. On Thursday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. for legislative business. Last votes of the week are expected no later than 3 p.m. No votes are expected in the House on Friday. Mr. Speaker, the House will consider a few bills under suspension of the rules, including a bipartisan bill dealing with countervailing duties against non-market economies like China. A complete list of suspensions will be announced by the close of business tomorrow. In addition, Mr. Speaker, the House will consider two bills focused on job creation and our creating an environment for that to happen. The first is H.R. 2842, the Bureau of Reclamation, Small Conduit, Hydropower Development and Rural Jobs Act, sponsored by Representative Scott Tipton of Colorado, and H.R. 3606, the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act, the Jobs Act, sponsored by Representative Stephen Fincher from Tennessee. Both bills are bipartisan, and I would note uh, that the President and many outside entrepreneurs like Steve Case have endorsed the Fincher bill. Mr. Speaker, I'd hope that Senator Reid would move expeditiously, expeditiously in passing the Jobs Act once this House sends it to the Senate at the end of next week. Again, I thank the gentleman from Maryland, the Democratic Whip, for yielding, and I yield back. I thank the uh, gentleman for his information. Uh, and I would uh, say, with respect to the, uh, the bills uh, that he will be offering, uh, we have, as the gentleman knows, considered four of those bills on the floor. They passed overwhelmingly. I think they're good bills. Uh, look forward to uh, supporting them again. Uh, there are two bills which are uh, new, uh, one of which was considered, of course, one of the bills was considered uh, when it was sponsored by Mr. Himes. It was a good bill then, and it's a good bill now. And uh, I believe our side uh, certainly is going to join in uh, supporting these bills, which we think will have some positive effect on uh, small business, entrepreneurs, business formation, capital um, formation. Uh, I've had the opportunity of talking to Mr. Steve Case, uh, a good friend of mine, and I want to th thank uh, Steve Case, as I know you do, uh, for his role working with the White House, working with us uh, on uh, moving these bills forward. I think they're a positive uh, contribution, and I look forward to, as they have, as, as the gentleman knows, they, uh, four of the bills received over 400 votes uh, when they were first passed on the House floor uh, not too long ago. Uh, and we think those are, are, are positive steps. So uh, I look forward to uh, next week uh, being a week on which we can vote together on something that uh, I'm sure America does as well. And again, I want to congratulate Steve Case for the work that he's done uh, with respect to this package. Uh, I do want to, have, however, say that uh, we do look forward to a, a, a additional uh, uh, legislation dealing with jobs creation. We've talked about the President's Jobs Bill or other jobs bills that uh, might be offered. We would look forward to those uh, coming forward as well. Let me ask the gentleman uh, uh, one of the uh, jobs-related bills that we're talking about, of course, is infrastructure. Uh, in this case, the highway bill, the infrastructure bill. Uh, can the gentleman tell me uh, that is the gentleman did not mention that for next week. Does, can the gentleman tell me, in light of, and I know he's concerned about, we're all concerned about the March 31st date on which uh, the highway program will uh, run out of authorization. And as the gentleman knows, there is a, a, a severe funding shortage, and it is our fear, concern, that literally hundreds of thousands of people will lose jobs if we do not uh, act. Uh, can the gentleman tell me when he thinks we might be acting uh, on either a big bill or an extension? I yield to my uh, friend. Yes, uh, I thank the gentleman for the question. And uh, as the gentleman knows, there's been a lot of discussion 
uh, about the way forward given the fiscal reality uh, of the Transportation Trust Fund. And uh, talks are continuing uh, to ensue as we continue to watch what the other body does on this bill, as well, on this issue as well, uh, knowing full well uh, the March 31st deadline uh, that we're facing. Well, I, I thank the gentleman for that information. I want to assure him that uh, our side of the aisle looks forward to working with his side of the aisle towards uh, hopefully coming together with a bipartisan uh, bill, which will uh, certainly keep the program going. But uh, from our perspective, more than that, uh, be an investment not only in infrastructure, which this country needs to remain competitive, uh, but also in job creation, which we think this bill will do as well. Uh, the Export-Import Bank, as, as the gentleman also knows, uh, authorization will be uh, coming to a close, and uh, uh, the Financial Services has uh, shared jurisdiction uh, with that. Can the gentleman tell me uh, what the status of the Export-Import Bank is? As the gentleman knows, we, uh, I think we have a, a joint agenda because I think a lot of things are uh, on there are uh, supported on both sides now, but we call it Make It in America agenda. We believe this is very important uh, for Make It in America, encouraging manufacturing uh, here in America and, and job creation. Can the gentleman tell me the uh, status of the